All right, so <clears throat> we're ready to go live. I'm going to be sharing my screen. We're going to wait for a few more minutes. And hold on. It's mine. So, um, we're waiting just a little longer so we can start. So, um, I want to know if everybody can hear me. Be so kind to let me know if you can all hear me out, if everything is okay, if you can hear me. Um, you can write in the Q&A or the chat. Um, the, the chat area, if you can hear me out. Cool. Here somebody said, perfect, I can hear you. That's awesome. That is awesome. Brilliant. All right, let me just get out of here for a moment. And let me go back to the presentation. Cool. All right, so it is three. Let's start on time. All right, so can everybody see this first slide? I need to know if you guys can see the first slide and then we can start, all right? I just, yes, perfect, brilliant. So I'm gonna start. <clears throat> well, if you're here, watching this webinar is because you follow me via social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram. So I'm not gonna waste my time doing an introduction of who I am. Um, this is a, a webinar in English. I have been asked for many people to do it. Um, we had over 200 people that registered for this webinar. I don't know how many people are gonna be attending at the end, but it doesn't really matter because we do this and I don't care if it's only four people or 400 people, 4,000, it doesn't really matter, all right? So <clears throat> today's topic is intro repair of porcelain fused to uh, metal restorations. The reason I am doing this one is because after talking to a bunch of people that went back to the office during COVID, um, during COVID that were doing emergencies and so on, they were, I asked them, what is it that you're seeing? What is it that you're doing? Um, what kind of patients are coming to the office? And um, not all of them, but some of them told me, hey, you know, we're doing, a, uh, I got some repairs to do. I got some, um, some things that I need to do um, that they don't come in usually before, you know? So um, a lot of patients with pain, a lot of patients with um, endo emergencies, broken restorations, and then of course you have the, the repairs. Um, when you look at, this is a little bit about myself. It doesn't really matter. Um, let me just go here. So we are, dentistry is going to change, definitely. Uh, it is changing, it has changed in the past two months. So these things are really interesting because now we're gonna have to have a different approach. A, a totally different approach to everything that is going to come into the to the office. We're going to have to protect ourselves differently. We're going to have to protect our patients differently. We're going to have to protect our staff differently. So it is a totally different approach. The type of patients that are going to come at the beginning are going to be patients that have very specific needs because for the most part, the population is, you know, it, it, it's in fear. They are scared of going out and, and, you know, being infected by the virus, you know, being contagious, so contagious, everything that is happening, all the information that we're getting, patients are not gonna run into the dentist unless they really have a need, all right? So the type of patients that are gonna come to the office are patients that are living under a lot of stress. If we had stress before now is, 
exponentially bigger. And the reason for that is because, you know, a lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people are in, you know, in, they have financial issues. Uh, it's going to be difficult. And it's going to take time for wheels to start turning again. So people are going to come in. They're going to have a lot of stress. They are under a lot of stress, but they have to go to the dentist for whatever reason. So stress will have an impact on everything, you know, in your life. Um, the, way you, your, the way your body reacts to stress is different on, on, on everyone. You know, some people, um, they, they start losing weight. Some people gain weight. Some people start feeling aches and pains and, and you know, headaches and people start grinding their teeth, clenching. Some people that were not clenching before, now they are because they, you know, the situation is so overwhelming that they're going to basically have a, they, they, they need a way to vent and, and, and clench in their teeth is maybe a way of doing that. You know, um, some people are not good at coping with stress. They will have, you know, GI issues, stomach issues, all sorts of different um, things are going to happen to somebody who's under a lot of stress. And right now, these are very stressful times. So from a dental perspective, you're going to have patients that come in with TMJ disorder issues. You know, they're going to have people that come in with pain, you know, fracture restorations, endoemergencies. Sometimes you're going to have to do an extraction. And even if the tooth, you can save it, maybe the patient will tell you, I don't have the financial means to repair that tooth, to do an endo treatment and to do a crown or, or an indirect restoration even a direct restoration, maybe they're just telling you, hey, why don't you, can you save what I have? And this is the thought process now. Is this going to be the most adequate treatment? Is this going to be the best way to plan ahead? I don't know. I don't think there is an answer. But you, as a clinician, I'm, you're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to approach this based on the patient based on the financial means that the patient has, based on the symptoms, based on many, many variables, okay? Um, and you're gonna have to consider the stress that the patient has been going through for the past eight weeks. You know, you're gonna have to learn how to repair. Maybe this is something you didn't do before, but you're gonna have to learn how to do that. You're gonna have to talk to the patient and say, hey, I'm gonna do this repair, hopefully it will last long, or hopefully it will last enough so when you get back on your feet, you change that restoration, right? You're going to go to the point. You're going to have to do treatments that are isolated. And by isolated, it's like if you have a patient that requires some kind of like a, a full mouth rehab or, well, maybe that's too complex, but it requires that you change several restorations. Well, he says, well, I don't have pain in all those different teeth. I just have a problem with this one. So you're going to have to figure out how to solve that, all right? Elective treatments are not going to be there. Not at the beginning anyway. You're not, it's going to be rare for patients that come into the office and say, hey, I want to get a full veneer a case, you know, a full mouth veneer. Or I want to get something like a bleaching. You know, that is not going to be your everyday thing. Maybe in the past it was, but now, you know, hopefully it will, but it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. And you're going to learn, you're going to have to learn how to treat patients with pain, how to manage that pain properly. You're going to have to be that person that is going to solve that problem or guide the patient into a better state of, you know, of, of, uh, to have an, uh, help improve his quality of life. So repairs. This is something that everyone has seen in their office. Are these predictable? I don't know. I think if you do them properly, you can definitely have a better outcome. If some, something like this came to your office, your first thought process, your, your first thought will be, hey, I'm gonna remove this and exchange it for a new one. Well, maybe the patient cannot do that. Maybe he cannot afford, but he wants for you to do something in there. You know, and some of you might think, well, that's kind of like patching. Yeah, you're gonna have to learn how to patch. It's part of the game, you know? And again, maybe three, four months ago, you didn't even think about patching this. You know, you will talk to the patient, convince him, show him some pictures of what the possibilities are. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that now. You should give 
your best professional advice. However, the patient might be like, well, I just need this now. And then you're gonna have to say, well, can I do this? And if you can, do it and help the patient, save him some money and get him gone, get him gone, all right? So you again, you, you could encounter something like this where you have these mouths that require you know, a bunch of restorations and, 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 and you want to talk to the patient and say, hey, we can do something here, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time and it's going to, you know, require for you to commit both, you know, from, a, from your time and also financially. And the patient, you know, if you look at this, um, the first picture, you see that there is a broken porcelain with metal exposure and he's only concerned about that because those are his front teeth. And he's like, well, I just want to be able to, um, to change that, you know? So um, I hear, uh, okay, somebody told me here that slides are not being shown. So I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of the presentation and I'm going to show it again. I'm going to show it again. Hold on. I'm going to show it again. I'm going to share my screen again. I, I want to make sure that everybody's capable of looking at what we came here to show. And hold on. I'm going to share the screen. Here we go. So we're going to do it from here. Okay. And that way, hopefully you'll be able to see. So what I was showing was this right here. And I don't know if you can see the mouse, my cursor, all right? So the patient comes in and he says, hey, I just want this fixed. Or maybe I just want this and this edge fixed. You're like, what about this? Well, right now I cannot afford it. Oh, well, you know, but this looks bad. This, it looks dull. He said, well, right now that's not his biggest concern. You have to figure out what the biggest concern is for the patient and try to help him out, all right? So I'm gonna talk about how to do these procedures, all right? You're gonna have, you're gonna encounter stuff like this in the picture where you see an exposure of metal, a, a broken porcelain with an exposure of metal, or you can see just a chip porcelain. You should be able to do both. But we're gonna talk about mixed fractures or mixed surfaces. When you have a fracture and you have two different surfaces that are totally different and bonding to these surfaces is totally different, but they are combined in one restoration. So you need to know how to properly bond to both of these surfaces predictably, all right? So when you think about metal and ceramics, they're so different, so completely different. You know, your metal is malleable, it's ductile, uh, it, it, it transmits energy, the physical properties don't vary much, regardless of the direction of the load. That's called, uh, the metal is isotropic. And it's reactive, meaning that, you know, metals will corrode, all right? But when you think about ceramics, you know, ceramics are more resistant than, than metal. They're stronger to a certain degree, but they're also brittle. Metal can bend a little bit, um, but ceramics won't. Ceramics are just very strong and they just break, all right? Um, ceramics do not transmit energy, unlike metal. Metal will you know, transmit and dissipate the energy. Ceramics won't do that. And ceramics are, you know, when you put a load on a ceramic, it will definitely have a different effect based upon the direction and the type of the load. A ceramic under compression is very strong, but under shear or tension is weak. So you need to think about all these things, you know, especially when you're fixing something in the mouth that has been put under a certain amount of stress and also the load, where is it coming from? You know, in what part of the occlusion? You know, whether it's compressive or whether it's in shear or tension. So you have to evaluate the occlusion properly and try to, um, you know, approach that problem. So maybe you need to tell the patient, hey, we're gonna do the repair, but you're gonna need a night guard it's because you're clenching at night. So whatever I put in there, you're gonna break it tomorrow. It's not gonna last. So you need to evaluate all of that. And even if the, you know, your, your mouth guard is not, you know, you're not doing it on perfect teeth, at least give them something that it will probably relieve them of pain 
it will generate relief and will also have a, a positive impact on the outcome of that repair that you just did. So in order to bond, all you need is common sense. All you need is common sense. If you understand the process, the technique is fairly, fairly simple. I always talk about bonding as a, a process, you know? So when you think about how you bond your ceramic to the metal, this is something that is done in the lab. You're, you don't have to worry about that. You're not gonna do that. You're not gonna bond the ceramic to the metal. What you're gonna do is you're gonna place a composite on top of the metal and the ceramic. That's what you're gonna do. So this procedure is a lab-based procedure, okay? But we're gonna talk about a dental intraoral procedure. So the process is fairly simple. The first thing you need to understand is how to generate mechanical retention. Mechanical retention is what's gonna help you, you know, do your bond. Okay, mechanical retention is very important in any surface. You need to generate that retention, okay? So you need to understand that, your mechanical retention. And then you also going to need to generate chemical interaction. The use of a certain primer, some primer, okay? So you need to understand that first. Okay, I have metal, I have ceramic, usually feldspathic, okay? Usually feldspathic. How do I generate mechanical retention on metal? How do I generate mechanical retention on a ceramic? How do I generate chemical interaction on a metal? How do I generate chemical interaction on a ceramic? You need to think about that. Once you understand what the process is, now you're going to look for the technique that is going to work on those specific surfaces. The process is the same for everything, enamel, dentin, metal, zirconia, feldspathic, lithium disilicate, indirect composite, Fiberglass, it's always the same process. Mechanical retention, chemical interaction. How do you do that? It's gonna be, you know, that's where the, the differences are in the protocol, in the technique, but the process is the same. So on metal, your mechanical retention, all right, you're gonna achieve that via sandblasting, all right? Now, inside the mouth, sandblasting can be cumbersome, okay? If you have a sandblaster that works with water, such as AquaCare, you know, that's a really interesting sandblaster, or one uh, called PrepSmart, you're gonna be able to achieve a good mechanical retention, all right, on that metal. You can use that. Even a sandblaster that doesn't work with water, you know, one of these um, Danville, you know, micro etchers, whatever you wanna call it. They're a little bit more messy because they don't work with water, but you can achieve that. Now, not everyone has a sandblaster in their office. Not everyone, okay? So you can roughen the surface with a diamond burr. You can use medium or fine diamond burr on the metal carefully, okay, to generate roughness. There's your mechanical retention. You can do that, okay? Is it better than sandblasting? No, it is not. Sandblasting is always better, but you can definitely generate roughening of that surface. On the ceramic, on the ceramic, your, um, your mechanical retention, I'm sorry, I, I, I had an issue here with translation of the slide. Your mechanical retention, you're going to achieve it by the same way, okay? You need to achieve it, okay? You need to think about it. Now, can you sandblast ceramic? <clears throat> um, probably not, because when you sandblast feldspathic porcelain, you probably are going to induce, or you could induce, or generate microfractures. And feldspathic porcelain will fail by the propagation of one of these little micro uh, mi microfractures, okay? Crack propagation. So you, by doing sandblasting or even roughening with a burr, you may generate that type of um, cracks, micro cracks in the ceramic. So you gotta be careful about that, okay? You have to be really careful. And think about that if the ceramic broke, it was because there was a crack propagation already. So you don't know what's in there. Now, if you have like really edgy areas that you need to smoothen down, well, you can use definitely a burr. You may wanna use a fine diamond burr or ultra fine in order to remove those areas of the porcelain that are edgy or pointy you know, and, and, and just smooth it. But in order to generate proper retention, you should use hydrofluoric acid. 
Now, using hydrochloric acid inside the mouth can be difficult, okay? It is a challenge. You're gonna have to protect soft tissue and you're gonna have to protect adjacent teeth in case they are next to the area that you're going to repair, all right? You need to think about that. So when you sandblast, you know, people talk about sandblast and, and I've, I've read some articles and some people talking about how sandblasting, you know, metal in dentistry is not a good thing. Well, listen, sandblasting is being done at an industrial level, okay? It's being done. This, these are, you know, people sandblasting these large tubing made out of steel, which are going to be coated with something. So in order to generate retention, Sandblasting is done. So this is not new, okay? This is not dedicated to dentistry. Sandblasting has been done for a long time in many, many areas, all right? Many, many areas. So sandblasting is fine. Now here is your intraoral sandblaster, AquaCare. Interesting device. There's another one called PrepSmart. Interesting device. And then you have another sandblast without water, which is that one over there by Danville. There, there are other brands. It doesn't have to be Danville, I know Parkell makes another one. I think Ultradent has another one. So you can look for it, you know? So the difference is the price. Aquacare is anywhere between three to $5,000, US dollars. And, and um, your micro etcher, your little sandblaster without water probably cost you, I don't know, a few hundred dollars. It's up to you. If you want to purchase a sandblaster, it's a good decision. However, going, moving forward with the intraoral repair, you don't really need it, but it's highly recommended to have a sandblaster in the office. What everyone does have is a burr, whether it's fine diamond, coarse, ultra fine, super fine, and everybody has a handpiece, all right? You are going to be able to do the roughening on the metal with a, with a burr. You need to use water. So now you got some aerosol. You gotta, you gotta be careful with that. You have to be able to control that or find a way to control it the most, okay? But you can definitely do that, okay? If you don't use water, you're gonna generate a lot of heat. So you gotta be really careful, all right? You gotta be really, really careful. Again, if you're gonna be working on metal, you could use medium or fine. If you're gonna be working on porcelain, you should use fine or super fine, all right? but always under refrigeration with water. All right, now your chemical interaction is a little different. Now. It's a little different now because your metal will require the use of a primer that contains organophosphates. What type of primers are those? Well, I have a list over here, okay? A list over here of products that contain organophosphates. MDP, right? MDP being the probably the most popular one right now, MDP bonds really well to metal. So you got products like Z Prime, Monoban Plus. I'm not 100% sure if Monoban Plus has MDP, but it does have, contain an organophosphate and it does bond to metal very well. Clearfield Ceramic Primer Plus also has MDP and these are dedicated exclusively for priming zirconia or priming metal, okay? These are not light cured. Now, the ones in the bottom, Albon Universal, which is a, a, a bonding agent, a dental bonding agent. Also, you have the, the 3M product, Scotch Bond Universal, or Single Bond Universal, depending on which part of the world you're standing. Those have MDP. They contain MDP. However, you're gonna have to light cure them in order, them, in, in order for the reaction to properly take place. So the difference is a dedicated primer doesn't need light cure. An adhesive does need, a light, uh, need the light for, uh, in order for it to, to, you know, to be activated. So there is a difference. If you don't have a zirconia or metal primer, you can use your adhesive as long as it has some MDP, all right? So you have choices. Have to think about that. Can you use any adhesive? Not really, not all adhesives do bond to metal properly. MDP primers, containing primers, they bond very well to metal. And MDP containing adhesives, once you like cure it, they will bond to metal also. So on a ceramic, you're going to etch. Felspathic porcelain, 
you're going to etch with hydrofluoric acid. You have different types of hydrofluoric acids, not only because of the brand, but because of the concentration. Your concentration can vary anywhere between four to 5%, all the way to nine to 10%. So you have four, you have low concentration and high concentration. How is this going to impact? It's going to impact the amount of time you etch because it is feldspathic porcelain. It is very unlikely that you have a metal structure with lithium disilicate on top of it. No, 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 it's going to be feldspathic. So if you have a four to 5% hydrofluoric acid etch, you're gonna to have to etch that porcelain for three to four minutes. If you have a nine to 10%, you can etch it for one minute. Okay, so here's the difference. You need to look at your product, your syringe, and you need to understand what is the percentage of your etch. If your percentage is four to five, you have to etch between three and four minutes. If your percentage is nine to 10, you can etch one minute. Is there a limitation here? It's just the amount of time, okay? It's, it is just the amount of time. Okay, so here is the slide. You can take a picture of that. You can make a screen capture of that. Four to five, three minutes. Nine to 10, one minute. Concentration plays a huge role on how much time you're going to need in order to properly etch and generate that mechanical retention on porcelain. All right, now, what kind of primer are you gonna use? You're gonna need silane. You're gonna need silane. Pure silane. All right, pure silane. Most companies have silane. It doesn't matter. You can use Biscos, Ultradense. You can use 3Ms. You can use Ivoclar. Silane, not primers that contain silane. What you need is pure silane in order to achieve proper chemical interaction. This is very important. And because you're working intraorally, you cannot just apply the silane and, and, and then you know, continue. You have to wait for the silane to properly react. So I will recommend for you guys to wait about three minutes after you apply your silane, and then you move forward. So this is something that requires a level of thoroughness, all right? And it's gonna take time in order for it to be effective. Do not rush it. Do it right. Do what's best for the patient. Do what's best for the bonding to be effective. Okay, you're not in a rush, all right? You're not in a rush. You gotta do this properly, so you gotta take your time. And for properly silenating um, an intraoral surface, you're gonna need to wait for about three minutes, all right? So now, let's go and look at a clinical case. So you guys can take all of this, digest it, and then the information, we're gonna see how it applies clinically. In order to be successful when you're doing a bonding protocol, especially for a protocol that you haven't done before, write it down. Just write it. You know, write it down. And once you write it down, put it in front of you. And that way, when it, it, it kind of like you can write it, print it as a checklist. So, you know, roughen the surface with a burr. Check after you're done. You know, you, 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 you cross out, you check whatever part of the pr protocol you're doing that you're done with, and then you move forward, okay? Don't think that you're gonna be able to memorize this because these protocols are different from what we're used to doing every day. You know, if you're doing like, uh, you know, selective edge technique, everybody knows how to do that. Okay, I etch my enamel for 15 to 20 seconds, I rinse, apply my adhesive. You've been doing this for a long time, but probably doing this kind of procedure you haven't done in the past, or maybe you've done a few times, you know, you won't be able to remember it. So just write it down, have it in front of you, have a map, and the map will guide you from point A to point B with all the stops right in between. Write it down, okay? So, isolate. Yes, you're gonna have to isolate one way or another. I highly recommend that you use a rubber dam. Is COVID going to basically make all dentists use rubber dams for restorative procedures? I surely hope so. Using a rubber dam will allow you to be able to, to see better 
control moisture, separate the area that you're working on from the rest of the mouth. So when you rinse and you do all different kinds of things, none of those chemicals go into the mouth or the patient might swallow those, especially if you're working with hydrofluoric acid and all of that. Also, when you apply your primer, you gotta wait for three minutes. You know, the patient might move around his tongue and if it's in the lower region, you got saliva going on. So this is definitely gonna help you. The other thing is you are covering the patient, okay? You're somehow protecting him. So rubber dam isolation, it's something that you should think about, okay? You need to isolate. Now, I will always tell people that the best surface to bond to is a clean surface. Now, in the lab where I do all of my bonding, I have a controlled surface. But inside the mouth, you got moisture, you have bacteria, different pH, you got biofilm, you got plaque, calculus, all sort of stuff. You got caries, you got many things. So you have to clean the surface, use a profi cup, you know? A little bit, of, you make a little, you know, pumice and water slurry, just clean that surface, pristine, and now you're ready to bond, all right? So, sandblast, or do your roughening with a burr on the metal. Again, if you have areas of the porcelain that are pointy and edgy and kind of broken, jack, you want to smooth that, you can do it with a burr, but you have to be careful. Always use water, okay? Oh, I'm going to generate aerosol. Well, you've got to find a way to refrigerate the burr. You just have to find a way, okay? Now, once you're done with the roughening, you're going to etch. You're going to etch the porcelain, okay? You're going to etch the porcelain. It, using hydrofluoric acid inside the mouth, it's complicated. Now, as you can see in this case, the rubber dam has been placed and it's also exposing adjacent teeth. You can just isolate that tooth and the rest of the rubber dam is not exposing anything. You could do that. But in case you need to use other teeth in order to generate the retention of the rubber dam or for whatever reason, or let's say you're not gonna use a rubber dam, you're going to have to protect the adjacent, adjacent teeth and tissue. So there are products out there such as barrier gel that will basically create a boundary. So protecting adjacent teeth with barrier gel will allow for you to place your hydrofluoric acid and in case the hydrofluoric Fluoric acid kind of like runs into the adjacent tooth, the barrier gel will protect that tooth. Now, I don't have barrier gel in my country. I don't know where to find that, you know, whatever. I get it. You can use glycerin. Now, glycerin is quite runny, all right? It's quite runny, but you can use that. You can use glycerin and, you know, some people have told me, oh, what about Teflon? I don't know if Teflon is going to withstand hydrofluoric acid edge. I don't know that, <laughs> you know, because we usually don't do that in the mouth. We don't use hydrofluoric acid edge, you know, frequently. So using some kind of gel is definitely going to help you. Definitely going to help you. All right. That way you block the hydrofluoric acid edge from adjacent, adjacent um, tissues or tooth structure. All right. So you etch three minutes. If you have four to 5% hydrofluoric acid edge, acid, or one minute if you have nine to 10% hydrofluoric acid edge, all right? Now, you're going to apply your siling first. It might think that it's counterintuitive, right? Because you say, well, I'm gonna start with the metal and then go to the porcelain. No, you're going to apply your siling First, why? MDP containing primers are low in pH, all right? They have a low pH, much lower than the silane. Silane are usually hydrolyzed in a pH of between 
you know, four and six, okay? MDP containing primers, their pH is probably anywhere between 1.5 and three. Low pH will deactivate silin. It will have a detrimental effect. It will deactivate it. And now your silane will not bond to your porcelain, will not react to the porcelain, with the porcelain. So if you apply your metal primer first, your silane is not going to be affected. That's why you need to apply your silane first. Hey, Doc, what if my silane gets into the metal? Nothing. Nothing is going to happen. Can then, do you need to apply, uh, you, do you need to rinse that and whatever? It doesn't matter. Silane doesn't react with metal, all right? And you got to be careful. You know, you could, right here in this image, you know, this is a case by Dr. Adriana Manso from Brazil. Um, she used a brush, a bristle brush. You can use a micro brush. You can use whatever you want, but try to limit the placement to the porcelain. Nothing will happen if it lands on the metal, but be thorough, be careful, all right? Now, after you're done with that and you wait your three minutes, you're going to apply your primer, your metal primer. Again, you have two types of primers. You have your um, dedicated zirconia and metal primers, and then you have your, which contain MDP or some kind of organophosphate. And you have your universal bonding agents that have MDP or any adhesive that has MDP. Now you can apply that to the metal. No problem. What happens if it lands on the porcelain? Nothing will happen because silane has already reacted. So not a problem. Not a problem at, at all. So you apply your, um, your primer. Okay, or you apply your adhesive, but you need to like your the adhesive, MDP containing adhesive. On your primer, if you use a primer, you don't need to like your. And now you have accomplished the chemical interaction with both feldspathic porcelain and the metal. Remember, always apply the siling first. After you're done with the etching, it's time for the the silane, all right? And then your MDP primer. I had a question once. Hey, do I need to apply an MDP primer if I don't have any metal exposed? Of course not, because if you're just going to repair a chip porcelain, you don't need to apply an MDP primer or an adhesive with MDP. What you need to apply is just the silane, all right? Now, can you bond now you're going to mask that metal. And you can use many things to mask that, but it has to be opaque. If you use your regular composite that is not opaque, that it's maybe a body shade, it's gonna show. If you want to truly mask it, you're gonna to have to use something that is opaque. Now, Bisco has something that is actually pretty cool, that is a dual cured opaquer. Most people don't have that. And they have, maybe they have a very opaque flowable composite or a very opaque, you know, regular composite. Whatever is it that you're gonna use that is like cure only, you're gonna have to apply it in layers, thin layers. If it's a flowable, you're gonna have to paint a little bit and then you like cure it and then paint again, and then you like cure it. And you go like that until all the metal is masked. If you have a dual cure opaquer, it doesn't matter because it's going to cure chemically. Why is this important? Being an opaque material, a light cure flowable or a light cure composite, when you hit it with a light, the light is not gonna be able to go all the way through. It's gonna be blocked because it's opaque. So. Whatever is in contact or closest to the light is going to cure, but whatever is in contact with the metal and the porcelain is not going to cure or is not going to cure properly, okay? That's why you need to apply. If you, your material is light cured only, you need to apply it in layers, 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 until you mask that metal, all right? 
And then you, yes, you're gonna have to cure, you're gonna have to cure, you're gonna have to cure, and it's just part of the process. If you put a big blob and mask it all at once, what's gonna happen is that when you hit it with a light, maybe what's close to the metal is not gonna bond, or it's not gonna cure properly. So the bonding will be much, much lower. And you don't want that. You want this thing to stay in place. So again, the best idea or the best material will be a dual cured opaque resin, okay? Not everybody has that. I have a flowable that is opaque. Great, you can use that, but you're gonna have to paint it in layers, all right? In layers. And then you finish, you finish with your regular composite, not a problem. Once you mask that metal, you're good to go. Now, let me go back here. When you place a composite on top of here, of that metal, when you prime it with the primer, a, 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 an MDP containing primer, the surface is not gonna look shiny, it's just gonna be treated. However, however, if you use an adhesive that contains MDP after you light cure, you're gonna have that oxygen inhibition layer, which will allow for the composite to be more spreadable on that surface, to be able, it feels more like a tooth. So if you want that, if you like that, after you have done your priming, you can use any adhesive, just apply a thin layer, you know, thin it down, like here, and now your surface is, things can slide better. So you can sculpt better, if that is something that you would like. This is just a personal preference. Now, from a bonding perspective, you can use your composite on top of that treated surface or surfaces, and it's gonna bond just fine, okay? Now, if you already have an MDP containing adhesive and you don't have a primer and then you use it, you will do both things at the same time. You will bond to the metal and then you will have that surface that is probably for some easier to place that compo composite on, all right? And then you finish off with your composite, whatever you want, your aesthetics, whatever you want. Is it easy to accomplish beautiful aesthetics? It's better than having a piece of metal being exposed and when you smile, the patient is like, oh my God, look at that. You know, so whatever you do, try to make it as aesthetic as possible, but also think about that you're trying to replicate the, the effects that a porcelain does on, uh, on top of the metal with composite. You know, it, it, two different materials, the index of refraction uh, of the light is different. They're different. So do the best you can. Um, but make sure that you bond properly. If you bond properly, adjust occlusion and determine why it broke and you treat that with care, like a night guard, your restoration, your repair should last enough until the patient can exchange that restoration, all right? I just wanted to share this protocol with you. I'm gonna go to some Q and A. Um, you guys, you know, you guys are gonna go back, and um, and some of you guys right now feel like, oh my God, you know, it's so difficult, it's so hard. From every bad moment, there is an opportunity to learn. Nelson Mandela was incarcerated for decades in a cell that is, it was small. Yes, he was not exposed to COVID, but he was, it was rough on him. And he was able to come out out of that cell and have a great attitude towards life. We should try to do the same. I know it's not easy, okay? I know it's not easy. But think about, this is the moment where you can, you know, look back and, you know, take a step back and think about, okay, what can I gather from this? What can I gain from this? What is it that I need to do to make it better? Okay, you're in a bad spot, rough spot. How do you make it better? Take every opportunity to learn. So he said, I never lose. 
I either win or I learn. I like that. I do. And I practice that every day. That's why I always say, I never lose, bro. Never. Never. I never lose. I win or I learn from my mistakes, from my defeat. Okay? And I take that, digest it, and come out stronger. Or at least I think I do. All right? So thank you very much. Um, and I am ready to answer questions. So in my country, you're not allowed to use hydrofluoric acid in dental practice. Well, you're going to have to use a burr. Roughen the burr. Roughen the burr. Um, I don't understand why that would be the case. Um, I guess only labs can use hydrofluoric acid because of maybe the, you know, the pipes, the, the, all of that. Um, and um, so I, I get that. So you can use, you can roughen with a burr, but you need to generate some sort of mechanical retention. Should we cure MDP bond before applying composite? If you're using a primer like this one, and I don't know, okay, so I have, on this slide, I have two primers and two bonding agents. If you're using a bonding agent that is used on the tooth, and then you're gonna have to like cure it. If you're using a primer that is dedicated for metal and zirconia, you don't need to like cure. Okay, can I use lasers to etch surface on feldspathic porcelain and metal? I don't feel that's correct, but I don't know. I would not do that. That generates a lot of heat. There is no water in the metal or the ceramic. When you're working with, with the tooth, there is water. So I don't know. I will feel very hesitant on doing, you know, treating the surface with a laser. When you use a universal adherent in metal like all bond universal, you never evaporate the solvent? Yes, you have to. When you use your bonding agent, you are going to basically use it as if you were bonding to the tooth, okay? Evaporate the solvent just like you were doing it, okay? Follow the instructions. There are no special instructions when you bond to metal, okay, than when you bond to the tooth. It, it, it's just a different reaction. And yes, you have to evaporate the ethanol. And then you like here and you're good to go. All right? Let me see any other questions. I'm looking at this. Well, I don't have any more questions. I think I'm good. Well, um, 15 minutes before, I try to, uh, there is somebody raising their hand. You can ask the question, brother. Just write in the Q&A area. I think that the more, um, the more we are, um, the more questions we get, the more we learn from each other, okay? So it, that, that's very important. I'm just closing all the questions that I have answered, and I guess I don't have any more questions. Thank you, thank you so much for attending. It was a pleasure sharing with you guys. Hopefully this information will help you. Um, hopefully, if you encounter a patient that needs a repair now, you have a technique. You can definitely look, you know, deeper into, you know, the science and read some articles. But this is something that it, you might going to encounter in these interesting and different days. And um, it's been my pleasure. And stay safe. And thank you so much for attending. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Will this be replayed for 24 hours or so? No, it will not. This is a one-time shot, brother. One-time shot. Any advice to polish? You should use a Profi cup with a um, pumice and water. You mix it like you were going to clean the teeth. Just like that. Just like that. I'm getting here. Oh, I'm getting here, uh, let's see, should we cure MDP? That was asked, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, thank you so much. My pleasure, guys. You guys take care, stay safe. We're, we are gonna get out of this. It's gonna be different, but we are gonna get out. Stay strong.